right, well, welcome everybody to my home. Uh, we are still uh, quarantining here in Gaithersburg, Maryland. I'm Kevin McGratton, and I'm going to present some recent work in FDS uh, by myself, Randy McDermott, Glenn Forney, and Marcos Vinea of NIST, uh, Jason Floyd of Jensen Hughes, uh, Ruddy Mel from the U.S. Forest Service, Manuel Cheesy from the Italian Fire and Rescue Service, and Ruggiero Paletto, also from Italy, who's working with Manuele. Um, so I want to first talk about uh, the what we call the immersed boundary method that we're working on for FDS. So up until now, uh, as you all know, FDS has involved um, rectangular obstructions, and you put together your geometry, I mean, much like you would build something out of Legos. Um, but we want to move away from that and start looking at a more flexible approach to geometry. And to give you a sense of what that means, uh, consider the two pictures that you see on the screen here. Uh, on the left-hand side is a traditional uh, CFD rendering of a circle or a sphere um, with an unstructured grid. And many CFD packages um, are known for their ability to create very um, intricate grids around complicated objects. I mean, think about a jet fighter, for example, being designed and you have these tiny little grid cells uh, fit throughout the body. But for us, um, it's much more efficient and easier in the setup to consider just uniform gridding like you have on the right hand side. Of course, up till now we've also used um, a simple approach to the geometry where we make the geometry look like you know Lego blocks. But now we want to consider a situation where we immerse the obstruction within the regular grid and still solve the equations more or less on the regular grid, the structured grid, but extrapolate the solution of the equations to the boundary of the more complicated obstruction. And so uh, consider this image here where we have a sphere created out of triangles and we've immersed that sphere on a regular structured FDS mesh. Um, if you zoom in closely, you'll see that um, near the surface of the sphere, um, we cut through the regular um, FDS grid cells, and we call these cut cells. And so the solution method is to solve the governing equations on the structured cells and then extrapolate that solution to the unstructured cells that fit around the body of interest. Now, the problem with this is that, as you can see, you know, the cut cells can get very complicated. You now have these tri triangular um, boundary cells. All of these things have to be handled in much the same way that we handle the regular rectangular um, boundary cells and obstructions in FDS. And we started working on this uh, several years ago. Uh, Marcos Vinea has been um, principally working on this and he presented his work at this same meeting in Spain. Um, and he is still you know, steadily making improvements to this algorithm. It has been, um, shall I say, a bit more difficult than we anticipated because the functionality that we've built into the regular Lego block geometry, we have to repeat that with the cut cells. So imagine, you know, sprinklers, sprinkler droplets, radiation, um, holes, uh, things appearing and disappearing, all these all these things that we've done for the simple obstructions in FDS, we have to now replicate for these more complicated obstructions. Um, 
if you look at this picture, it seems remarkably simple um, how we represent these obstructions. So we have a new feature in FDS called a geom line for geometry. And if you had something like this um, simple pyramid, um, you just list the verts, which are just the vertices of the, of the object. And then faces are just three integers that define how these points are connected. So the faces represent the triangles and the order in which they're given defines the outward facing normal. And then there is an integer here, which allows you to assign a different surface or surf condition to it. So deceptively simple, but in practice, uh, much more difficult. And the difficulty comes from the fact that in order for this to work, these geometries have to be what are known as manifold. Um, anyone who has some experience with 3D printing um, knows that when you send a file to a 3D printer, it has to be structured just right. Um, and that is, you know, the object has to be made up of these triangles. These triangles all have to be perfectly fit to one another. Um, all of the outward facing normals have to be outward and consistent. So that means that you can't have things like, you know, two blocks just meeting together at a single uh, vertex. Um, you can't have a block that's just open. You know, these, these obstructions have to be completely closed. You can't have an obstruction that intersects itself. So not only is it a problem with the numerics, but it's also a problem just generating these obstructions. Um, here, here's an example of some work that uh, Marcos has done with uh, the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States, looking at some smoke detector testing within the fuselage of a 747. So you can see how you could really look at a very complicated domain using this technique, but generating this domain takes a fair amount of effort, even if you're using software like um, PyroSim, Blender, and what have you. Um, software like Autodesk Inventor will allow you to um, output manifold geometry, but still getting it all set up in FDS is still um, a bit difficult. And so one of the ways that we're going to transition from our current situation where we have the simple blocks is to stick with simple blocks, but add the ability to take a simple block and rotate it arbitrarily in space and translate it and so forth. So if you look at this picture here, we have two rectangular obstructions, which are input in much the same way that a current opst or obstruction is input with the six um, coordinates that define the rectangular obstruction. But then there is a move input line, which allows one to rotate the object around a fixed point and around a fixed axis and also translate it. So DZ, DY allows you to translate this. So you can take your, your regular old opst, rotate it, translate it, and then do your calculation. So here we are doing just a simple check of the radiation calculation where you have a hot wall here radiating onto a cold wall. Um, and as I said, you know, the, the difficulties in all this is now you have these blocks that punch from one mesh to another at strange angles. Um, there are just a lot of things to consider, even though this geometry looks very, very simple. Now, one of the things that has motivated this um, move away from the simple rectangular obstructions is the fact that we're doing a lot more work these days with um, large outdoor fires. Um, 
wind, smoke, large smoke plumes, and wildfire spread. I mean, obviously in the United States and certainly in many parts of Europe, um, the wildfires are seeming to get worse and worse these days, whether that's because of increased population, global warming, what have you, who knows, but this is certainly becoming a bigger and bigger problem, bigger issue, and we are trying to see to what extent we can apply our fire modeling to these outdoor fires. So here is just a landscape uh, made with the new immersed boundary method. You can see where you have the regular obstructions, or the regular grid rather, and each regular grid cell is cut with a diagonal. And you can see how this landscape flows much more naturally. So if you're doing a flow calculation, a wind calculation across this landscape, um, using just the Lego block approach, you're going to have trouble with boundary layers and, and that sort of thing at the surface. Whereas with the um, immersed boundary approach, we can much more naturally model these winds. Now, I did some work like this back in the 1990s um, when I was working with the state of Alaska looking at the possibility of burning large oil spills. As you recall, there was a big spill in Alaska in 1987 called the Exxon Valdez spill. And one of the possible solutions to something like this is to burn off the oil. But of course, if you burn off the oil, where does the smoke go? And so I was doing calculations like this back in the 90s with an earlier variant of FDS. And then the obstructions or the, the landscape were just modeled by you know, the Lego blocks. I used a particular software package at the time that kind of smoothed out these blocks. But if you look at this picture, the landscape here is made out of um, rectangular blocks. Um, so while we're on that subject of, of oil burning, this is a, a photograph of an experiment that was conducted off the coast of Newfoundland, Canada, uh, back in the 90s, um, showing you how one of these burns is done. And we developed at that time a program known as ALOFT, and ALOFT stood for a Large Outdoor Fire Plume Trajectory Model. And this, this model, it was a simpler version of FDS, but it had more or less the same core solver as FDS, and it was used to, to model a smoke plume blowing in the wind. Well, long story short, ALOFT has, um, is gone now because we put together a little graphical interface for it, but it no longer runs in modern versions of Windows. So we have um, moved on to using FDS to model uh, outdoor um, plume rise um, and atmospheric dispersion. There is a case in the validation guide um, called atmospheric dispersion that shows um, a plume rising into the atmosphere under different uh, levels of atmospheric stratification. Um, just to, to, to follow up on the um, the oil burning. So I stopped working on this problem back in the 90s, but um, in July 2010, um, there was a catastrophic failure of a offshore oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico, known as the Deepwater Horizon um, spill. And this oil burning was conducted um, after that. It didn't clean up all of the oil uh, because it was spread out so widely, but this practice is still um, part of the tools that are possibly used in the event of a very large spill of oil. Um, you know, another thing that we have to consider uh, as we move into the outdoors and looking at outdoor fires and wind is, you know, how we model the wind itself. Um, there's a whole field of study known as computational wind engineering. And we got a hold of some data. It was actually um, data that was sponsored by NIST and the experiments were done at the University of Western Ontario in a wind tunnel. And here you see a picture of that wind tunnel and a small obstruction representing a house or a small low rise building. 
And we've been using that data to validate FDS. So those of you who are interested just in wind can take a look at the uh, validation guide, which contains the test case called UWO Wind Tunnel. Now onto the fire, outdoor fires themselves. So, you know, one of the problems that we have in looking at outdoor fires is that a lot of it has to do with the scale of interest. Um, so what you see on this uh, slide is, you know, when you're dealing with wildland fires, you can look at a lot of different scales, length scales. For example, um, national weather services, like our National Weather Service here in the United States and NASA and NOAA and agencies like that, they often look at wildfires from a regional scale. So at this time of year, um, states in the west of the United States um, have a lot of fires going on, a lot of smoke is rising up in the atmosphere, and the smoke transport is handled by these regional scale uh, meteorological models. Then you have the situation where you have a fire in the vicinity of a town or a city. Um, you may be looking at length scales about 100 kilometers. Um, and there are certain kinds of models that are used for these scales. Then you get down to neighborhood scales where you want to look at much more, much more detail of how the fire is encroaching upon a a neighborhood, a subdivision, as you see in this picture here. Um, then you get down to looking at an individual house burning, how that house is interacting with the vegetation surrounding it. And then you can even go further and look at, you know, the details of the vegetation burning. So you can look at a tree or a bush or brush, fire spreading across a field of grass, that sort of thing. We've decided with FDS that we're going to focus on everything from detached combustibles up to about neighborhood scale. This is where we're focusing our efforts. There are a lot of um, other organizations that are looking at these regional and city type scales, but we're going to focus on the um, on the neighborhood scale and and below because I think that's where, you know, FDS has the most chance of having an impact. So <clears throat> if you look at the current FDS validation guide, you'll see experiments. Uh, one set is called the NIST Douglas fir experiments where we burn some trees in our lab at NIST. CSR, CSIRO grassland fires um, is uh, are some experiments that were conducted in Australia by the organization CSIRO, and we've modeled those. In this photograph, you have a 100 meters by 100 meter field of dry grass, and we're modeling the fire spreading across that. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service has conducted or has sponsored experiments in its own lab and in other labs, for example, at the University of Corsica. Um, experiments that are bigger than bench scale, but let's call them lab scale, where you have um, brush, leaves, dry grass, um, arranged in a pan that might be one or two meters on a side and a couple and maybe 10 meters long. And you look at the fire behavior spreading through the, the brush. Um, Ruddy Mel has done some work where he looks at uh, fire spread through stands of trees. This is just a, a close-up of uh, one of the simulations of the experiments known as the catchpole experiments. Um, the Forest Service did hundreds of these experiments with under different conditions, different types of, of brush, um, different uh, wind speeds, different levels of humidity. Humidity matters in these, in these types of things. And so here you can see a tray that's about a meter wide, eight meters long. The fire is started at one end and the rate of spread is, um, is measured. And you can see here from this plot that it's very difficult for FDS to, you know, nail these experiments down. There are lots of uncertainties in describing the grass, the kinetic properties, 
um, numer other numerical parameters. But we are starting to um, get a better handle on this, and we hope in years to come to produce more accurate simulations. Just to give you a, a sense of you know, what we're dealing with, I mean, if you consider the CSIRO experiments, um, these were done in, in northern Australia. This is one of the grasses that was burned, it's known as uh, kangaroo grass, which is just a tall, dry grass. And you typically know from these types of experiments, you know, roughly what the height of the vegetation is, you know, the ambient temperature, something known as the surface area to volume ratio, which essentially gives you the, the thickness of the vegetation. Um, you have some idea of the mass per unit area, and then you know the moisture fraction. Um, everything else is kind of picked through the literature, um, you know, in terms of um, the pyrolysis properties, um, ignition temperatures, um, kinetic properties, all of these sorts of things um, have been measured for different types of vegetations, but um, much like with, you know, furnishings within a building, you know, getting the right properties for, you know, something like kangaroo grass is still a bit of a challenge. My hope is that um, if we do enough measurements of enough types of vegetation, we might find that, um, as far from a fire point of view, that um, there's not much variation within a given, um, you know, type of plant, like a, a shrub is a bush is a tree. Um, we're hoping that, you know, the, the basic elements, the cellulose, the lignin and that sort of thing will produce uh, properties that are, um, that are not varying very much because we'd, ha we'd hate to be, have, be in a position where we have to literally go out and measure all these properties for every type of vegetation. And this is just a snapshot of, you know, what a calculation like this looks like in FDS, where we have, you know, the usual grid, um, grid cells for um, a wildfire spread would typically be anywhere from, you know, maybe a quarter of a meter to a meter. We found that in order to do these kinds of spread calculations, you pretty much need to be at a meter or less in, in resolution. You can see here the little sticks down at the bottom represent the grass. These are just Lagrangian particles that have the properties of a thin cylinder. And when you put it together, and these are the CSIRO uh, experiments, these are in the validation guide and you can get them from the GitHub site where we store all the validation um, input files. You know, here's what fire spreading across um, 100 meters by 100 meter uh, plot of dry grass looks like. Um, these calculations can actually be run on, uh, I think I ran these on 36, with 36 meshes, and this calculation runs in about an hour. So, you know, those of you who are interested in wildfire spread, this would be a good place to start um, this set of experiments. Um, here are some experiments that uh, Ruddy Mel did uh, about a decade ago, kind of laying out, you know, where we're heading. We want to be able to look at a fire um, spreading through a neighborhood. We want to include the house, um, the vegetation in the yard, um, the road, and see to what extent fire breaks, barriers, terrain, all of these things, um, how they affect the fire and how uh, future neighborhoods can be designed better to withstand these kinds of fires. Because we don't think that these wildland fires are going away. Um, we're just going to have to design neighborhoods uh, better to withstand them. Here's another simulation uh, that I performed uh, more recently. Um, this is just a demonstration of the uh, functionality. What you see here is uh, a piece of terrain in the United States that's one kilometer by one kilometer. Um, the little green dots, the bright green dots, represent the Lagrangian particles making up the trees. Um, the, the background is just a um, satellite photo of the Earth in this, in this region. So we've just taken that uh, texture map 
put it over the terrain, and now we're looking at the fire spread. And this calculation was done at one meter resolution with 400 meshes um, to simulate one kilometer by one kilometer, and it took a few days to run. So this gives you an idea of how difficult it is to do, um, you know, let's say, let's call them, let's call it a physics-based uh, simulation of a wildfire. Now we know that at this stage, you know, we can learn a lot from these calculations about fire behavior, but it's not the sort of thing that can be used, you know, the day of a fire. This is more of a planning tool. However, we have another um, feature that we're developing in FDS right now, in which instead of actually modeling the fire with Lagrangian particles, we use a technique known as level sets. And a level set calculation is literally just a two-dimensional calculation in which you look at the fire line and you solve a simple PDE in two dimensions that tracks the fire line as a function of time over the terrain. So given, a, given the terrain, the type of vegetation, and a wind field, you can, in relatively short order, you know, calculate the fire spread. So our colleagues in Europe, uh, Manuele Gizzi and Ruggiero Poletto and a, and a few other folks, have developed a very nice little plugin to QGIS. QGIS is a, an open source uh, GIS program. I think it was developed in Bucharest um, or somewhere in Europe, but it's, it's very popular. And Emanuele wrote a little tool called QGIS to FDS. So you basically zoom in on the terrain you're interested in. He wrote a little uh, Python plugin that will export the terrain to FDS, and then you can run a simulation using the level sets. So this level set calculation in FDS can be done literally in minutes because you can instruct FDS not to um, do a detailed wind calculation, not to do a detailed fire calculation, but rather just to track the level set. And in this slide here, we see a, a snapshot of the burn scar from the, obs the observed burn scar from a fire that occurred near Genoa uh, last year, known as the Cagoletto fire. Um, so the red shows the burn scar, and then the green shows an FDS rendering uh, of that same burn scar. So in this case, we just start the calculation where the fire starts. We, we produce a wind field that varies only in time, not in space. So FDS is just doing the level set calculation, and this kind of calculation can be done in minutes. Um, now this is at its early stages, and uh, we certainly would like to work more with this sort of thing. And um, those of you who are interested, this functionality does exist um, now in the latest version of FDS to do the level sets. Um, the QGIS to FDS is up. Um, there are more details in the user's guide about this, um, and I'm certainly willing to answer any questions that you might have. So those of you who are interested in wildland fire, maybe a good place to start would be, you know, this type of level set calculation. Good talk. Thank you for that. It's interesting yeah. to see how everything's evolving over, over time. I was, I was wondering, just in our back channel, um, once the geom system's implemented, would you still need obstructions? Because you could do geom XB and then just basically it's the same, just no translation. Well, that, I mean, that was that's a thought that, um, I mean, we, we always have the possibility that you can, you know, use a CAD package and develop something, you know, crazy. Um, but for a lot of people who just want to set up a calculation, you know, by hand, you know, if you want to just create a simple house with a roof and all that, the mm -hmm. thought, yeah, that these, yeah. that we just let the obstruction feature evolve to be more general. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because then you'll have OBST and GM unless there's any difference in how they're yeah. handled behind the scenes. Like yeah. they almost become the same thing. Right. So often um, in my work, I just 
I just set things up by hand and just to me mm-hmm. rotate something 45 degrees <laughs> is without having to go to a CAD package and, you know, set everything up. Yeah, there is a question here about adaptive mesh refinement, um, and Randy's answering that it's <laughs> not in the current plan. So um, <laughs> Eric Tonicello is saying he's done some forest fire simulations as well, and the choice of correct parameters is very challenging. Yes. Publications help us a lot. Um, also a question, Randy's jumping in here, uh, <laughs> when you're planning to release FDS7, it's hopefully within the calendar year. So anyway, thanks for... Yeah, which calendar year? Uh, well, I mean, I, I mean, we should say that. I mean, all of, a lot of the stuff I've been talking about is in the current version. I mean, we only maintain yeah. one uh, code, um, mm-hmm. so there are verification cases, a few validation cases. It's just that we haven't, you know, fully documented it yet, and all of that. So, I mean, we are. If if people are really interested and they want to kind of um, start playing around with it more than welcome and you know we're always available during the day um, during our day you know to answer the questions Mm -hmm. yeah and it's probably not a bad thing too if somebody's really interested to get in there and try to play with it a little bit and see if anything breaks Uh, well that's what the big worry is that i mean when you have just these lego block obstructions there's just there's kind of a finite number of ways that one can screw things up Right. Now we're dealing with like a, an infinite number of ways that you can create <laughs> trouble. Yeah. 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 And that's something we were talking about too. Like we want to make sure we've got a good test tooling for people to try to import things and export things and create geometry right, and all right. that stuff. So. And all the, you know, in the video game crowd, I don't know if they appreciate the fact that, you know, the, the geometry that you see for a video game, you know, isn't manifold. It's just, it's just objects that are, up on the screen to make it look like a castle or whatever. Yeah, and if you push the right button or do the right thing, you can fall through the floor and fall <laughs> forever into it below the surface. Yes. You know, it's not solid. So, yes. um, there was a question here: um, Will it be possible to combine the level set method with the CFD solver, like fire spread from wildland to buildings? Yes. So, um, what I described in my talk was just the entry level. That is where you just literally you have the terrain. You specify a constant wind and you just do this quick calculation, which literally can be done in a minute. It's very, very fast. And this will give you this kind of spread of the of the fire over the terrain. Um, but we have four different modes of operation where you add in complexity. So at the at the highest level, you still use the level set to spread the fire but you actually track the smoke plume, you you generate the winds, you generate the fire, you know, the, the fire itself generates winds, so you have all the full coupling. It's just that you don't need to get down to, you know, sub-meter resolution and start resolving, you know, the plants and everything else. You're still, you're still at two cores of a resolution. And when I say two cores, you're, you're doing these calculations at 10, 20, 50 meter grid cells. Mm-hmm. So you, you can't really predict the fire spread. You're using this empirical model, the level sets to do that. But all of the other fire features are, are in there. In fact, FDS literally is creating a fire. So when the level, sp- level set arrives at a given location, that location starts to burn. It's almost a sophisticated way that we do fire spread now where you, know, you specify a point on a vent and then the point, the fire emanates outwards in a circle. Imagine you you did that, but instead of a circle, now you've got a more realistic fire line. That's what that's that's where we're heading. Cool. Um, we're just wrapping up here, so there's a few more questions. Feel free to answer those in text chat here. Um, there is a capability. I'm just answering. There is a capability in Smoke View to do set rendering, so that's a possibility. That's also an option in uh, the PyroSim Results Viewer. Um, so those are two separate questions. And then, um, yeah, so, and we did talk about that in the beginning if GM replaces OBST, and I don't think not quite yet, but that's a question yeah. that we talked about in the beginning of the Q&A here. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for all that, Kevin. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and we're transition to the next talk, but if there's any other questions show up here, feel free to enter text okay. as Randy's okay. doing. And so. certainly you can even right. use the FDS tools if you want to ask these follow-up questions. Follow up. Couple of days. Excellent. Thanks, Kevin. Right. Appreciate you. Yep. Take care.